emerges study that are defined. They're kind of uh, broad. Um, they move around quite a bit. They're out and about. But they do aggregate in three situations, and we'll go through these here with some video. Uh, this is all video. Most of it is video I took. Um, but one of the places you can find manta rays is around cleaning stations. So they're covered in parasites. Uh, and just like turtles and all other fish, they'll visit these cleaning stations. You can see all the little white copepods, um, and they get clean. So the mantas are known for their, their big wings and their cephalic fins, those two fins out in front of the body um, that they use to gather food. They kind of uh, push the water through their gills. Uh, you can see all the little Hawaiian cleaner wrasse. They like to do the inside job, get into the gills, into the mouth, and the sow wrasses go around the outside. So these cleaning stations are very important. That's how I was able to do my PhD work, by visiting these cleaning stations and having a high probability of seeing mantas there. Every once in a while, a cleaner cheats, takes a bite. You see them react like that. Uh, just to give you a little difference in Ponape, uh, we also get the same manner, but they get the black morph there. We sometimes see them off Kona, but the pigmentation is reversed. So rather than having the, the black spotting on a white belly, they've got the black, uh, white spotting on a black belly. Now mantas, again, this is a cleaning station. They don't see real good above. So one of the ways I'll talk about some of the research, how I measure their size. I basically get in their blind spot, go above them. You'll see the two laser dots, and I take pictures. I know those laser dots are 60 centimeters apart, so I go back and I'm able to measure the disc length, and I can convert that to a disc width. So we'll talk about the size in, in a few minutes as well. So one of the great things about Ponape is the cleaning stations have been a certain part of the tide cycle, and when the food comes in, uh, they'll begin feeding. So you get both ends of it. You get the cleaning, and you get the feeding. Now, for some of the largest species, uh, largest fish in the ocean, they eat the smallest little critters. They're plankton eaters. Um, the schooling fish here, the fusiliers, will also eat those little zooplankton, so that's why you often see them together. And depending on how the food is spread through the water column, you'll get these different types of feeding. Some of you may have seen this barrel rolling. We get it in Kona. They dough with the mantas over in Kona on a night dive. Uh, they bring in the plankton. So if it's spread out through the water column, they try to move through the water column, uh, spinning backwards and trying to collect as much of those uh, plankton as possible. But once in a while you get someone who's creative, we call that one sideways, always going in the opposite direction. Pretty cool to see if others pick up that strategy as well. We see that in, in whales where certain feeding strategies get passed on and picked up by others. So once the tide switches, they go feed and then back to the cleaning. In Kona, we see a lot of the surface feeding in the daytime. So if all the plankton is congregated on the top in current lines, you'll see this ram jet feeding. So, and, and they don't care if you're in, your, in their way. When they're feeding mode, they kind of just go for it. So this was off Ulithi in Micronesia, uh, a remote atoll we were trying to find. Uh, we heard mantas were there. Uh, it was uninhabited atoll, and we finally found them on the last day. And they were feeding through all the way down to the bottom, coming all the way to the top. So you know the food is spread all the way throughout. And sometimes you'll see this train. So someone might say, how do you know that's not a mating train? Well, I can see the cephalics are open, the mouths are open. Okay, they're feeding. So the, the food must be concentrated in a line, so they all kind of whether there's hierarchy in that line, we don't know, but uh, that linear feeding is something we see a lot as well. At the cleaning stations during whale during uh, mating season, which corresponds with whale mating season, uh, you'll get these females being pursued by a large number of males. And the female is sexually dimorphic, she's larger than the males, and essentially the males don't even uh, they don't force mate, kind of like humpbacks, they kind of follow her around. She's actually pregnant, you know, bulging she is. So why would they be pursuing 
a pregnant female. Well, we know in captivity, the only birth, and I'll show video that's ever been seen, they made it with her immediately after she gave birth. So, so I've seen up to 28 males pursuing a single female. And what's great about when you get these uh, mating trains, the female is very curious, like I said, she's not being harassed, she's kind of um, deciding who's the fittest, and they'll come past right over. So she's curious, she'll come over my head. And then all the males, because they're linear, they come right over as well. So I get ID, 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 and I'm looking for the claspers in the males. So I know it's a male, the claspers, the claspers. Um, and those spot patterns on their belly, that's, that's the identifier, just like a whale's tail fluke. So I build a catalog of all those spot patterns. But this used to be regularly common over at Oluwalu, my study site, but we don't see it that much anymore, unfortunately. Um, how do they know whether she's an estrus, whether she's you know, ovulating? Probably through uh, defecations or urination. There's a lot of uh, information about her reproductive state. So you see these animals go in behind and uh, uh, likely taking in the information from her physiology. Another female, large female in the front with all these males. And what you'll also see, these males aren't feeding on each other. So it's very interesting. It's unlike humpback where males will compete, get bloody, they get very physical. They're not physically fighting with one another. There's another lead female coming straight up. So we think it's more of an endurance rivalry. These mating trains could happen over uh, several days, and probably the longer these animals can stay with her, uh, it shows their fitness level. I did look at the size of the male closest to the female. There was no differentiation. Like male humpbacks that are closest, the primaries tend to be larger than the challengers. So we even get mixed groups. You get uh, the regular morph and the black morphs together sometimes pursuing uh, that female. Those are very cool to see those the black morphs. And they occur in both the pelagics as well as the reef associated mantas. I have never seen mating in 15, 13 years. This is how it happens. This was actually in Yap. So that's the female there. The male actually grabs onto her wing. Of course, she's a willing partner in all this. Um, she's much larger, as you can see. And then it's almost like birds mating in the air. They, they, she, he'll wrap his body around, and remember those two claspers? He's gonna insert one of those claspers into her cloaca. But just like with humpbacks, I've studied humpbacks for years and years in the water, never seen mating. No one's ever documented it or giving birth. Same here. I've only known of a couple of instances where people have witnessed it or gotten video. So she's just resting there, allowing that to happen. There you go. Now birth, I mentioned birth's never been seen, but it has been documented in captivity. This is the Okinawa Aquarium in Japan, very poor footage, but you can see there's, they give birth to a single pup every three or five years. The pup is rolled up like a burrito in there. And once it's released, that's it, it pups on its own. Wings immediately unfold, takes its first few wing beats, and there's no parenting at all. They're, they're kind of on their own. So we've never witnessed it here. The pumping grounds are kind of a mystery. Uh, threats globally, there are direct fishing threats or bycatch in fisheries. Uh, there's a market in East Asia for manta ray gill rakers. Um, since they kind of got a good handle on the shark fin ban, they needed a new market of something. Manta rays seem to be the new thing. Fortunately, there is uh, they did get listed as CITES, so it's illegal to trade mantas or export mantas without a permit. Here in Hawaii, fortunately, we, uh, they're protected from being hunted uh, or taken, but we do have issues 
uh, with our shorelines, all the, the uh, armoring our shorelines it affects our reefs and our environment. Um, a lot of the mud water events after these heavy rains, all that silt that's coming off the mountains, it's picking up herbicides, pesticides, petrochemicals, uh, a lot of nasty stuff that floats over the reef. It uh, suffocates the reef, blocks the sunlight, and the reef is very important for food and for cleaning stations for the managers. So runoff is a big, big problem. Entanglement is also an issue. <coughs> A lot of the mantis have a fishing line wrapped around their bodies or their cephalic fins. When gear remains, I've seen it, it's usually a lure gear. So the shore casting, uh, it kind of hook the, you kind of hook your line into the rock and then you slide a, a taco uh, into the water. Um, an octopus, you kind of sit there overnight, have a few beers, and hopes a big lure grabs your line. Well, the manta ray cruises in shore. If it hits that line, it'll barrel roll, presumably, and wrap itself tight. And it could cut off the cephalic fin. Uh, it, could, it could do a lot of damage to the cephalic fin. So one in ten, actually, of the mantas in Maui uh, have damage, some kind of impact to the cephalic fin. So that gear we picked up it was actually with Maui Ocean Center. They go out and clear that area all the time. But it's constant. You know, after you cleaned it up, it's there's just as much there a week later. And uh, over on the Big Island, they're having some issues with propping. You know, there's a lot of boats coming in to these areas, uh, and they do get uh, dinged up a bit um, with uh, the boat engines. So how do we go about researching the mantas? This is my main study site in Maui here at Olawalu. There's a few ways we can observe. Um, the easiest way, there's photogrammetry where we measure size. Uh, we can take some genetics, a lot of important stuff we can learn there. And tagging is another great uh, tool. So when we're out, we're looking for the most basic, what species? Is it the pelagic or is it the uh, reef associated one? I've only seen one pelagic at Oluwalu in 13 years. They come in off the deep water, sometimes in Molokini, sometimes uh, in Kona, because they're off deep water. The pelagics tend to migrate. They're not resident like the ones we're used to. They can get up to 22 feet in wingspan. They're huge. Wow where the, uh, the ones we generally see here get up to 20, to, uh, to 12 feet. So Byrostris is the uh, species name for the pelagics and Alfredi for the, and they're actually not manta anymore, they're mobile. So the big, uh, if you want to know whether you're looking at a pelagic, usually the mouth has black around the mouth, these black, Borders around the body are distinct uh, pelagic. And the spots that I talked about, uh, they're not between the gills. They're more in the belly area. You won't see them between the gills like you do in the alphabet eye. Uh, if you're looking above, they'll have that chevron. That's a pelagic, classic characteristic. And the shoulder patches are pretty separated, almost like a snow plow going right through. But for the most part, you'll see these guys, the spots between the gills, you know, not a, a, a big division in the shoulder patches. The other thing when we're observing, I keep talking about claspers, just like sharks, they are, they are sharks, um, related to sharks, that the males have the claspers, the females don't. But you want to be careful on young males. I mean, they look like females, but the claspers are quite small, they're not fully developed. Once they reach maturity, those claspers extend beyond the pelvic fins and they calcify. So you can tell a mature versus an immature male. Females a little harder to know whether they're mature or not. Of course, if they're bulging out from both ends, you know that she's pregnant, so she's mature. If she's being pursued by a bunch of males, likely she's mature. And remember that male biting the wing? Uh, even though I've never seen the mating, I look for the, it's generally the left wing, 90% of the time it's the left wing, uh, but you'll see these mating scars for where they got bit. 
So that's fairly common, and I've determined <laughs> at all females by those mating scars. I also look for threats, either shark bites. Uh, about 19% of the animals here uh, have evidence of surviving shark attack. Compared to other populations, that's not bad. In Mozambique, it's 80%. So they're pretty lucky here. And of course, that spot pattern um, is very important for cataloging. So keeping life histories of individuals over time, uh, this is even outdated a bit. We're, we've passed 450 individuals just in Maui, unique individuals. Kona is famous for their mantas. They only got about 300 over there. <laughs> Uh, one of the other things we can look at is sighting rate. So every hour I'm on the, uh, at my study site, you know, there's so many mantas I'll see, and I can plot how that sighting rate changes over time. And unfortunately, it's declining quite a bit. So back in 2009, you know, on, on average, you know, I may have 20 one day and have two another day, but on average, just over six mantas. Now, um, less than you know, 0.39%, I think it's dropped beyond that as well. The number of times I don't see any mantas, it used to be one in 10 dives, now it's almost, it's nine out of 10 dives. So probably because of the reef degradation, maybe some shift in their food source, even though I don't see them feeding there, it's probably close proximity to a feeding area, but this is something that's a little disturbing that we want to get a handle on. Photogrammetry. Um, this is my little instrument here. It's basically a piece of aluminum that was machined so that these green lasers are exactly 60 centimeters apart. So anytime I project those two dots onto something, I have a scale in my photograph. So I can measure as long as the animal is perpendicular to the camera lens, I can measure uh, the size. So it's unobtrusive and it's very, very accurate. And um, we can look at uh, the sizes, how they differentiate males and females. Females get up to 12 feet and males get just under 10 feet here in Maui. But what's interesting is the minimum size. I didn't have any less than 80 feet. This was over, you know, 140 animals. They're all bigger. I know they're born at, at uh, five to six feet, so what are all the little guys, right? So there's sexual or, or age class segregation going on here. I mentioned we don't know where the pupping areas are. The only pupping grounds I know of that I've worked is in Palmyra. It's about 800 miles south of the Big Island. You have a big lagoon. Um, give you a size per sec perspective, that's the runway right there. But they'll come in and out of this channel, it was dredged uh, during the war, and uh, in there I get, I've measured some little guys in there. So the only pumping area that's known, uh, I suspect Sugar Beach might be a pumping area in Calgary Harbor. And we'll talk a bit more about these little animals, something exciting happened in the last few months. Tagging is another way to keep track of where they go. You can put acoustic tags. Uh, basically, it emits a signature, a high-frequency signature. It doesn't interfere with other animals. And you have receivers spread out. They do this with shark tracking. Every time it comes within range of that receiver, the receiver records it, and it records its specific signature. So people share data. If they're tracking other fish or sharks, say, oh, here's the data from my receiver. You look if your tagged animal came close to that area. So you can also follow the animal in real time. So if you have a, a listening device on your boat, you can listen for the pings and just follow the animal for a couple of days. And you can also match from photographs. If somebody from Molokai sends me photos, I can see if they match any from the study area. So there have been matches to Molokai, South Maui, and Molokini. And then the active tracking we did, uh, this animal over a couple of days went to Lanai, and this one went to Kovalave. I guess we had permission. 
going on. <laughs> but uh, clearly they used the Four Island region, but none have ever crossed over the Big Island. We were always wondering how connected are the Big Island and um, the Maui population. So this is essentially the known home range for those uh, Oluwalu mantas. None of the photographs match any of the ones from the Big Island, and none of our tags cross. And the genetics, which is the last thing I'm going to talk about, supports that. There's, there's uh, not a lot of uh, connectivity between the two islands. So it's probably a little bit, but they seem to like spinner dolphins. They seem to act, get everything they need right here in Maui, and there's no need to move off. But genetics, you get a little skin plug from them. You can learn about contaminant levels, maternity, uh, stock structure, the genetics between groups, um, speciation, um, what they're eating, a lot of information. You just you save your little plug and then you share it. You take little pieces and share it with other researchers. So again, the 20 samples between the two islands show very little connectivity there. So what does that mean? Why is that important? It means when we're managing our populations, like we had a dramatic decline in our Oluwalu sighting rates. Should Kona be concerned? Well, probably not, because they're a separate population. So we know we should manage them island by island. We also look at the food they're eating by towing uh, plankton nets. And uh, So to go back to what was going on with the little ones, I got reports that there was a manta ray in Malai Harbor that was feeding. First of all, I've never seen that just feeding in Maui, so I was all excited. And when we went there, when I measured the size, it was the smallest one I've ever measured. So I suspected maybe it was, this is what it was feeding on, little copepods, which we got out of the plankton net. Got a tag on it, got a little bit of data from its dive profile. Um, this is what the tags look like right here. So they're tow tags, satellite tags that transmit data through the satellite. And all of a sudden, and that tag came off at Sugar Beach where I suspected it may be coming from. So lately in South Maui, they're seeing lots of young mantas. I'm getting reports all the time. I've been able to measure a few of them. I've been able to do the plankton toes to see what they're feeding on. And it's the same stuff, copepods. So I don't know why these cocoa bots are all of a sudden uh, swarming in shore over in South Maui, but we're getting a ton of new data. We got a couple of tags on animals, um, and they're diving up to up to uh, 300 feet in places, um, 400 feet in others. So you, this is night and day cycles, and you can really look at how they're using the water call and the GPS tags. The placement has been tricky, but I think we got it now where you place it so when the animal is at the surface, and it is at the surface quite a bit, it, it gets a GPS recording. So not only are you getting the depth profiles, but we're seeing where it is. So where does it look like it's feeding? Where does it look like it's uh, maybe at a cleaning station? Things like that. So the tags are, being, are very informative. So, as again, the South Maui, we have over 20 individuals, new individuals that were never in the uh, Oluwalu population. So, I'm sure a lot of you are in the audience that have been helping out with those photos. Please keep sending them. Uh, we're going to try to get more tags out. I don't know how long this phenomenon will happen, but it, we're learning a whole lot. Uh, and I suspect those, those young mantas in Sugar Beach that are being born, they're spreading out and they're starting to use that South Maui coastline as a food resource. They're not always you know, tight to the shore, sometimes they're offshore, but they're, they're not spreading out to these other islands and um, over to Oluwalu quite yet until we get much older. 
Okay, so the next half, all right? Prepared to go on a bit of a roller coaster ride here. Stay with me. What is the state of our plan? Well, we've all heard about the big Pacific garbage dump. There's more plastic out there than there is plankton. Uh, these are these are cities, massive cities of trash floating in the middle of the Pacific. It's pretty bad. Uh, our albatross up in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, where it's uninhabited, they're so remote, yet the chicks that are dying there, they're full of plastic, because the, the adults are uh, scooping up the plastics on the ocean and feeding their chicks. Um, if you guys saw that albatross movie, wow, that's a heartbreaker. So recommend you watch it, because it is uh, revealing, but very depressing. As the oceans get more acidic, anything that has carbon uh, skeleton in it, coral, mollusks, even plankton, will begin to dissolve. That's a big concern. Species extinction in the last 50 years is ridiculously out of control, uh, skyrocketing. I saw this article recently in the past 40 years, they suspect half of all species have gone extinct. So in my lifetime, half of all species have been wiped out in my lifetime. That's ridiculous. And to put it more in perspective, you guys have heard of the vaquita dolphin uh, in the Gulf of California. It's not even a target species. It's caught uh, as bycatch as they hunt for the swim bladder of the fish. That is a delicacy in East Asia. That fish is endangered, and so is the vaquita. In 97, they estimated 600 left. By 2014, there was 100 left, 60 the next year, 30 the next year, and since March, they believe there's 12 left. So imagine, this is a species that's been around for millions of years, millions of years, but it couldn't handle my generation. It knocked it out, and I can't imagine these fishermen that are pulling these out of their nets they're taking the last of a species, and you know what? They gotta feed their family or whatever. It's unfathomable, but it's uh, pretty crazy. We're, we've wiped out 95% of all sharks, big fish on the planet. We're really good at taking uh, resources. Mantas, we talked about, they're sometimes a uh, direct catch or a byproduct of that. And to put it in perspective, I was like this video, share this video. Wise, smart guess, and it's good to be smart, but not too smart for your own good. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build the clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes, but at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. In our quest to explore the galaxy, rechecks and neglects the home that we have here now, so no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens. We willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help wanted signs. Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, so if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before, or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfire than ever before, because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more than trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extension of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. What a feat in the next 10 to 100 years. Every beloved animal character and every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lions gone, rhinos gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear gone in three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us in this three seconds. In an existence shorter than a Vine video to turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody, help. We were given so much, the only planet in this solar system of life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned to the sun so we don't burn, but not too distant so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best. We are just like this paradise where we are given medicine from trees. Not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family. Literally, everything, every species is connected genetically from the sunflower to the sunfish. 
And this is what we must recognize before it's too late. Because the real crisis is not global warming, environmental destruction, or animal agriculture. It is us. These problems are symptoms of us. My products of us. Anyway, yeah, I think the three second just blows my mind, you know. And that's the 250,000 years we've been on. We've actually done the most impact in the last 50 years. So it's just a fraction of the time we've been here that the damage we've caused is unconscionable. So how did this all happen? So why don't we look in the mirror real quick, and how does the U.S. play a role? We, we are 5% of the world's population. And yet we consume 25% of the world's resources. Okay, so if everybody in this in the planet consumed the way Americans had, the same appetite, we need seven planets to fulfill that appetite. Of course, we only have one planet. So now that I've bummed you down, is there any hope here? I would say yes. Okay, and bear with me here. I'm going to go through. Um, Four things are kind of a little out there, but I want you to stay with me on this. And just to keep things simple, you know, we'll start with the basic goal of everybody. Every animal is to increase our happiness and decrease our pain and suffering, right? That's what we're trying to achieve. That's what everybody is trying to achieve with our decisions. And we teach our kids and teach everybody is if you work hard, you study hard, you will be recognized. You can earn a good salary, you can gain some stuff, and you'll have, you'll be happy, right? That's the model, that's the American dream. We want to be rock stars, we want to be rich and famous, we want to be uh, athletes, you know, that's everybody's goal. Right? We, the rest of the world idolizes this model, okay? This is the assumption, right? And those of you old enough to remember Benny Hill, he said, whenever you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. So what if that model is not true, right? Then what are we chasing on this treadmill, right? Well, we have science. We have people that go out and measure happiness. So we don't have to wonder. We just go out and measure it. So here's a study, one of the many, uh, where they went to 143 countries, and they measured everything from child survivorship, uh, length of life, health, happiness, lots and lots of metrics. And all of these countries are on this graph here. On the x-axis is your happy life years. The higher up you are, the longer, happier life you have. On the y-axis is your footprint, how much resources you're consuming to achieve those long, happy life years. There's the global average. What you see here, all these squares, that's sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, very short lives, brutal life. Not a lot of footprint, but it's it's not a, it, they're fighting disease, civil war. It's a very bad, uh, way to live. On uh, the other extreme, these triangles, that's the Western world, some Middle Eastern countries. Good lives, long lives, but tremendous resource consumption. Massive footprint. So where we want to be is more in the green, okay? They're living almost just as long lives, happy lives. These are all the triangles. These are the Latin, Latin American countries. And then you got this country way up here. What is going on up there? They live longer than Americans, happier lives at a fraction of the resource consumption. This is Costa Rica. So why don't we find out what is Costa Rica doing that we should be doing? So they listed the top five things that, Costa, that makes Costa Ricans happy. Number one is the connect, their relationships with family, friends, and their communities. Number one. Okay, two, they're active. Three, they take notice. Okay, we often live in the past or live in the future. Appreciate what you have now before it's gone. That was number three. They're constantly learning. Doesn't have to be academic, but keep the brain going. Learn new uh, hobbies, new recipes, whatever. But they're learning. And number five blows my mind. You know, the complete anti-economic giving. And there's plenty of studies where they give a hundred. They get two groups of people a hundred bucks and they say you guys go spend it on yourselves and you guys spend it on other people and then they measure the happiness of those people the ones that have gave the money away are happier than the ones that spend it on themselves the great thing about these five top things is 
they don't cost the earth. There's nothing in here that requires raping the planet of its resources. I love this other study too. In 75 years, they tracked uh, over 700 men. A um, third of them were first year Harvard students. The other two thirds were from the poorest neighborhoods. And they measured everything from, oops, I blew away the conclusion. But they measured everything <laughs> from their health, their diet, their salaries, their job. One of them even became president. But it was only supposed to be a short-term study, but it, people kept taking it on. I think nine of them, a few of them are still alive today. And they, had, they interviewed friends, families, and they wanted to know what created long, healthy, physically healthy, mentally lives, happy lives. What was it? We got all this data, 10,000 pages of data. They compiled it all. One thing was significant predictor. It didn't, care, it didn't matter what Ivy school you went to, what salary you made. It was relationships. That was the only consistent predictor of a long, healthy, happy life. Okay? Remember, connect, same thing. Okay? Again. So what am I trying to say? I'm saying we can bring all those countries up to that green part of the graph, have, have great lives and without compromising the planet. So this is very hopeful. So what's going on with our... Um, equation here. So I'm going to switch to the second thing in this brain chemistry. Uh, there are four main chemicals in the brain that make us happy. I'm going to talk about the two main ones, dopamine and oxytocin. I told you I'm going to go off on tangents. <laughs> so dopamine is great. It's great for getting you motivated, getting things done, right? You want to, you want to, can't wait to get your A on your test or um, you ever write a list out? You had a long day, but you've already done three of them, but you add them to the list anyway, so you can cross it yeah. out. That's <laughs> dopamine, dopamine. Oh, it feels good. It feels good to get the dopamine shot. Okay, the problem is, out of balance, it can be problematic. It's very addictive, okay? It's as addictive as heroin. It causes stress. It, it suppresses the immune system. So out of balance, it can be a real problem. Okay, you guys, anyone here th think they're addicted to their cell phones? Every time you hear that ding, right? And you're driving and you cannot wait 10 minutes to look at what the text was, that's dopamine. Okay, you wake up in the morning, you have to check your phone, that's dopamine. Okay, I'm addicted to my phone. I'm addicted. I got an iWatch, I got an iMac, I got two iPhones, I got an iPad, I got it all, right? I'm still miserable. <laughs> so, uh, mean, um, I think that's what's going on. I think that's the treadmill, right? We're, we're, we need that next hit. We need, and we're willing to, to prostitute our children. We're looking at anything to get that next hit of uh, fame or fortune to get that dopamine. So it's very problematic when it's out of balance. Oh, there's some sounds. You know, every time that FedEx package shows up at your door, right? The Amazon.com on you get something. We all we all do it, but that's dopamine. All right, one more video. Enough talking.
Experience watching that video is your brain got flooded with oxytocin. Okay, that's the other drug. Okay, and oxytocin is great. Okay, it boosts self esteem. Oxytocin, what happens when mom and child, once they're born, it creates that bond. Okay, it's that feeling of being safe, trusting. That's when the team wins one for the coach, not for themselves. That's oxytocin. It decreases stress, okay? It boosts the immune system. And most importantly, it inhibits the dopamine addiction. Okay, if you're ever having a bad day, you should try this. It, it, you know, go into a grocery store, find someone who's got just a couple little items, line up behind them. When they get to the crash register, ask them, can you do me a favor? You know, I've made some bad decisions in my life. Would you be okay if I paid for those items? And I put the context like that so they don't feel like you're pitying them or anything like that. You'll get a shot of oxytocin and you'll feel great. That person receiving the help will get a shot of oxytocin. Probably never happened to him in his life. But remember that. Cashier will get a shot of oxytocin. Anyone witnessing that act of kindness gets a shot of oxytocin. So you walk out of there, maybe you spend a couple of bucks, you'll feel great, you'll remember that. Um, oxytocin is a great chemical to, to increase happiness. And it, people who get it are more inclined to do acts of kindness. So if you go back into that, those five things, a lot of them, these are oxytocin boosting uh, behaviors. And what's great about oxytocin, it doesn't cost the earth, it's actually, beneficial to us as communities and to the planet. So, okay, bear with me, I know it's getting late. Number three, uh, what about stuff? Does that mean we gotta give up all our stuff? You know, what am I talking about here? No, we can keep our stuff, we just need to design smarter. Okay, design with nature in mind. Okay, the way, the way we build stuff right now, is we use about 350 polymers to create everything in our life. Okay, we do the heat, beat, treat method. Okay, we dig it out of the ground, we heat it up, we treat it with some nasty chemicals. Uh, it's usually carcinogenic or doesn't break down the environment. That's the way we uh, make our things currently. Every other human, uh, living organism on the planet uses five polymers. Okay, trees, they take energy uh, from the sun. They bring water hundreds of feet up the ground without pulleys, without uh, engines, you know. And guess what, the stuff that they make 
So over, we're talking 30 million species. Use only five polymers to create the skeletal structures, uh, the ways to get energy to gain water, uh, filter the air, you name it. You know, they've got over four billion years of, of research and development. So they are a source of, of how they probably already figured out what it is we're trying to figure out. They've just done it in a way that doesn't kill the next generation. So there's an increasing field, um, a growing field called biomimicry, where they're taking engineers and biologists together, and they're trying to find function in nature that can apply to a problem we're trying to solve. Uh, they're mimicking wind turbines with humpback whale flippers. Um, they're creating surfaces that mimic shark skin. Sharks have very little bacteria on their skin. So rather than chloroxing and these nasty chemicals on countertops and doorknobs, they're building surfaces that are mimicking shark skin. They're building air conditioning that mimic termite mounds that don't use any mechanics and pulleys. It's all um, natural. And there's a website called asknature.org where biologists are pumping it full of functions that nature has solved. And engineers can go and just search it and find ways they can build their things that aren't going to kill off the planet the next generation. So that's very exciting to me. So all other life creates condu uh, conditions that are conducive to life. They don't create things that are going to kill the next generation. It makes no sense. We're the only species that does it. So biomimicry, I think, is a way we can continue to have our stuff, but do it in a way that's that's keeps nature in mind. And the last thing, the most far-fetched thing, are you going to roll your eyes, but uh, it's a resource-based economy. Okay, what does that mean? When we send somebody to the space station, right, you kick into accountability. How much air are they going to use? You know, how much clean air? How are you going to filter that air? How much food do they need? How much water? Okay, you, you operate within the confines of the resources that you have there. Otherwise, people die, right? cruise ships that we land do the same thing. You take inventory of your natural resources and then you function within that inventory. Okay? We live on a money-based economy that has no connection to natural resources, right? Is the Dow Jones up or down? Is it should I be happy today because the NASDAQ is up? Oh it crashed, you know. I mean we live our lives looking at these numbers, these money-based economy and I call it the dopamine addicted economy. And it's killing the planet, it's killing the future for our children. So I don't have time to get into the resource based economy, but if you want to learn more, I think it's the oxytocin based economy. Uh, check out the Venus Project online. And I think that is the way to go. So that is it. So I believe there's hope, you know, with some of those really far fetched solutions. Some of you may be like, what is he talking about? I thought we came here to watch him. But um, if you think a lot of this is far-fetched and maybe off the top, I ask you, ask yourself one question when you go home today. Okay, there's only, the only thing you take home from this talk, ask if you had, how would you spend your time if you were told you had 24 hours left to live? Okay, I guarantee you, Muslim, Christian, black, white, rich, poor, everybody's going to have pretty similar answers to that question. Okay, and that tells you what is most important in your life. So, um, and the answer to that question is where you should spend more time uh, uh, doing that. So if you're neglecting family and kids, pursuing uh, more money because you want to have put your kid through college or neglecting this, you're probably not doing what's most important in your life. So, I leave you with that because I think all of this tied to the environment that's struggling right now, that's going to impact the man rays, and I think there's hope if we can have an intervention and have a mental shift. So, thank you guys. I don't know if I do all this.